Hey everybody, welcome back to Game Bytes, our show about creating video game assets. I am your host, Omni Jakala, and today on our show we have Andrew Coleman. Hey. And Will Bowerman. Hi. We've got the Bomberman gang in here. All right, so this episode <laughs> is another installment in our series about our HD remake of the first level of Bomberman Hero on the N64. So today we're going to be focusing on one particular asset, which is the training robot. Now this is the first enemy that we encounter in the game. He's sort of just like a kind of generic looking R2D2 knockoff. Basically, he just hovers around the stage. We were trying to figure out, there's not a concrete place where the names of these enemies are listed. So we've been going by the Japanese manual. So the name more or less literally translates to training robot. Um, in Japanese, that's kunren roboto. Um, and the description more or less says, uh, if it can see Bomberman, it'll chase him. If he can see Bomberman, which is always. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, he's the he's the Goomba of the game. He just introduces you to the concept of something that can do you harm. And uh, he's not very interesting looking. He's he's kind of ugly, if I'm to be completely honest. Oh, yeah, that's rude. <laughs> well, he's got like this <laughs> kind of garish, like arbitrary markings on the on the white part of his body. It's just like here, triangle diamond lines. It's, I don't know I what do they wanna, were thinking. I do want to note that designers were had in mind when they were drawing those designs. Probably not much. I mean, they're so limited in the, the amount of real estate they have for these textures, so they probably were just like, what can we fit here that's uh, kind of interesting? Triangle and other things. So we kind of started uh, thinking about how we could revise the design here to kind of be more interesting but before we talk about our redesign let's talk about just the general behavior of this guy so basically you walk into the level and if you walk to the right you discover that he is already chasing you his his behavior is to basically turn toward the player and then go in a straight line to wherever the player was when he spotted the player and if it collides with a wall or if it reaches a certain distance uh, from its starting point and then it'll stop and turn again and repeat the cycle and so that's that's pretty much all he does. He's uh, not very interesting. So when we were thinking about redesigning this robot, the first thing was just to kind of smooth it out, obviously. Same general silhouette. We didn't want to change too much about the, you know, the outline of the character, but we did want to make some some changes. So the dome now has this kind of I don't know how to describe this. It's kind of like a sports car kind of contour on the top. Oh, yeah, what made you go towards that design for the dome? I think I just wanted to make it not just a half sphere that's skewed over. Aside from that, the body design now has the same general color scheme, but we traded the mm. triangles for these sort of ob round pill-shaped kind of designs. And then the red diamonds we've traded for just these two red lights. And then the back, rather than just being a repeat of the front, we just kept it blank it reads better as which way it's facing that way and then we've got the sort of like blue ball with two rods sticking out of that like what even is that on the original design so i thought it might be fun for that thing to actually move and then we've got like a gear like a cog in the bottom of the base there which is kind of inspired by the general stripiness of the gray stripe that was there in the original design which i don't think animated or anything like that but I thought it looked enough like the parts of a cog that would stick out if it was, you know, horizontal like that. I guess you could also interpret it as like LEDs, something. Oh, I was kind of thinking it like could be lights yeah. as well, yeah. It could be. Like a conveyor kind of thing, yeah, it could be that. I mean, this was sort of like a one and done kind of deal. There wasn't a lot of iteration. I just kind of threw stuff at it and then it stayed. I guess one significant change would be that there used to be like a kind of weird spark like in the inside of the dome. And that's been traded for two lights. One is like an amber blinking light, and the other one is a siren. So I guess we can use that as sort of a segue to the behavioral changes that we made to the character. Like we said, originally, as long as Bomberman exists, he is constantly pursuing Bomberman. You just can't see him off screen, but he's always aware of his location and he's trying to move in that direction. So by the time Bomberman gets close to the robot, it kind of looks like he just discovered Bomberman, but for ours, especially because it's widescreen now, it's it's a lot more apparent that if he was always to know where Bomberman is, it would be visible from much earlier. Instead, we decided 
why don't we just have them sort of wander aimlessly until Bomberman gets close enough to the robot. So now, when Bomberman gets within a set radial distance, the robot is alerted, his siren goes on, he jumps up, and we can talk about the animations in a bit, but he turns to Bomberman and then starts doing his thing, like, basically, like he did in the original, but now only when Bomberman's close enough. I guess one question that I feel like people might bring up in the comments is why would we have him just run in a straight line instead of having him pursue and chase Bomberman around ah, turns and corners? No, that's a good question. And, and actually, Andrew brought that up while we were tr trying to think through, like, how, how much do we want to change this behavior? And uh, you could make the case that it, it makes sense for him to just constantly face, like, adjust to face the player every frame, you know? But it occurred to us that for a, an enemy that's the first thing you see when you start the game, it's a little bit too difficult for the player to deal with that kind of constant pursuit. Because Bomberman, the way he attacks is by throwing or kicking bombs at your enemies. So, Or by placing bombs down right. in a spot. And, and so the thought was that if he's constantly chasing the player, then the player would have to be running away from him and then turn and then throw a bomb or something. Or just drop a bomb, I suppose. But we thought it would make sense for the, the enemy to be easy to evade and then move in a straight line so that you could react and anticipate where the robot would be in a few seconds rather than having to deal with this thing that's just right on your back the whole time. And I think I think that the, the behavior that you guys, uh, that, that, that uh, Andrew implemented is is more straightforward, right? I don't think it just does a straight line and then stops in the original game, right? It goes in a straight line and then it if it hits a wall, it would it would turn around and then Oh yeah? Yeah. Yeah, when um, it hits a wall, that's when it checks Bomberman's position and it just faces where Bomberman's currently standing. Yeah. And then it just starts moving towards that point that it set when it hit the wall. And it doesn't adjust until it hits another wall. Or until it hits oh, okay. another training robot. Like a I ledge, guess. right? I don't think this enemy appears outside of the first world. Yeah, I, know, right? I don't know that it does either. Like this enemy is explicitly designed for this first area. That's why it's named what it is. Yeah. The idea, I guess, is that at the Bomberman base, which is where this first level takes place, they have these robots that they use to train Bombermen and women to, <laughs> yeah, to but learn how to fight. They have, but if that's the case, why are there a bunch of springy dudes and chickens? Yeah, all I over don't the know place? because. Pion, Pion's all over the place, right? He's not just in... Yeah, the chickens also appear in later levels. Right, well. so maybe they just took those and, like, kidnapped them and used them for their training. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they, maybe the base is infested. I mean, the I way that... we're thinking too hard about this fifth the, yeah, generation the lore. game. <laughs> As of this recording, we're kind of on the fence on whether or not the white part should be more of, like, a space-age plastic or a painted metal. So I, I guess do, I feel like I like thinking about it. I kind of like how he feels like a lawnmower, like an old, <laughs> an old machine Beat up in that thing. way. Yeah, it does make yeah. sense for if they're if they're constantly blowing up and reassembling these robots for training purposes. It makes sense for them to have a lot of scuff marks, a lot of damage. So I I'm good with that. And then he's got we've got some glass on here, and it's not something that you had in the original. With the original, they just used like flipped normals on that dome mesh so that you can only see the interior faces from from the back so the front faces are just not even drawn yeah it's a fun little visual trick yeah is there actual refraction of the content inside the dome or is it only yes is there, there is okay. you can see that the green piece inside of the dome on the edges is kind of like warped inwards ah, yeah i see that so one neat detail about the um, material for the ball joint that I like is how the part that has the like actual cover is much more scuffed. When you see the joint move around, it's, you get to see the kind of half pristine, half worn away portions, which is kind of cool. And you'll see that in the animation. So how do you suppose these arms move on top of the ball? Like what mechanism it uses? That's a good yeah. question. I, it, it, <laughs> I feel like it's kind of like the Nendoroid Kirby, <laughs> where it's like a magnet on the interior that that, <laughs> that has a rotation of some kind. Because it had to be either that or some kind of wheels on the interior of that blue bowl, and I don't anticipate that that would fit that kind of mechanism. Mm -hmm. So it has to be some kind of interior thing. So this is one of the first ones that we've done in the game that has some sort of particle effect associated with it because we had you know, Pion and then we had 
box. I guess the box had quite a bit going on, but this is the first character that has something. And basically, because he's hovering over the ground, I thought it might be cool to have it sort of kick up dust. And uh, we had a little bit of iteration because some of what we were trying to do with other particles when we were testing was going after this sort of Mario 3D world kind of look where these we have these like really chunky looking puffy clouds puffy clouds yeah and uh we like that look i think it fits the the aesthetic of the franchise frankly but when we tried that on this particular uh particle effect it looked way too pronounced so instead we went with something that's a lot more subdued something that's pretty transparent and it's it's very subtle yeah, I think you said something like it looked like they were riding on a cloud. Like yeah, the whole it looked time. like like a Likitu cloud or like. Oh yeah, I could I could I could <laughs> see that. Yeah, like a genie, <laughs> just this resting inside <laughs> of a cloud. So uh, something that's a bit more subdued felt better, and especially when it's moving, it just it just felt more like what we were going for. And then we have the uh, fragments of the enemy when it's destroyed. And Andrew, you designed these little chunks in Blender, which I did not know. I thought they were maybe just procedurally fractured in, in Unreal, but you actually did these by hand. I feel like I can't trust the fracture tool <laughs> to, to make <laughs> That's fun. fair. So I guess in the, in the last game bite, we covered how um, Sonic Generations has, have those multiple pieces per enemy that just split off when the enemy dies. So we're kind of emulating that sort of style here to some extent, where we have predetermined chunks of broken pieces of the enemy that will fly off after the explosion happens. So all, all of the pieces here, there's no like extraneous parts, like you don't get three LED lights on accident or anything right. like that. Right, yeah. So I set the, um, the amount that spawned to a amount that made sense to what that part was. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so he mm. only can, he can spawn zero to two arms or he can spawn two to four gear pieces since these are split into fourths things mm -hmm. like that and i guess that kind of transitions us well into some of the animations that we had to create for this character which uh is probably the most involved we've had to do so far at least that, that you guys have seen and those are the sort of idle wandering movement where they just hover above the ground and all they really do is turn and their arms which are kind of like antenna are just rotating to different random rotations once it's alerted it kind of jumps up into the air and uh then it send its arm back it it sort of does a ninja like run a <laughs> i was gonna say he, he uh when he's surprised he throws his arms up like he's shocked yeah like he's, yeah <laughs> like he's seen something but then once he starts pursuing Barman, he throws his arms back and starts running like like Naruto. Which at, is... first we, at first we had it where his arms pointed forwards like right. he was tracking Bomberman now. But that actually doesn't make sense as he goes in a straight line. And the reason that we changed it was that mostly I wasn't happy that the uh, ball joint kind of had the bowl intersecting with the body in a, in a way that didn't make any sense. So I wanted to keep the constraints of how much it could rotate. So instead it, it, it's just kind of diagonal back. On top of that, we have the collision where he either hits the player or he hits a wall and he kind of just gets knocked back. You know, it kind of bounces off the, the thing that he just ran into. And then we have the death animation, which actually, Will, you wanted to do a little bit of animation because you like it. You like doing animation. I, yeah, it was, <laughs> we were talking about animations um, a few weeks ago and Andrew was like, man, I don't like animating that much. <laughs> and I was like, I, I like animating. And then, we, and both Omni and Andrew were like, let's let's just run you through a Blender crash course right now. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, it's, it was actually surprisingly intuitive for uh, an application that's notorious for not being all that intuitive, at least in the earlier versions. Yeah. But in 2.8, it's it's not bad. Yeah. And I mean, you you've got plenty of experience doing animations for your games so yeah exactly so i i i mean th this is the death animation is not like amazing i'm not like super um it's like it's not the best thing i've ever done but but it is like this is the general kind of idea 
um, that I thought would be suitable for the death animation. Like when we were looking at um, animations, like the death animations that we might try for, for characters in this game, um, we wanted something chunky, um, so we kind of, again, referenced Super Mario Odyssey like we have for other things so far. Um, and, and in Mario Odyssey, um, the enemies um, we'll do a backflip when you when you um, beat them. Um, I want to say I, wanna, I was going to say kill, but kill feels wrong. <laughs> defeat to apply to Mario. Yeah. yeah, when you defeat them, yes. Specifically, um, when you toss your hat at a lot of enemies, they get kind of flung backwards and flip. Yeah, or or like if you use um, something like the, like the hammer bro or the, the like the pan bros pans or you know something like that, yeah. um, enemies will flip backward. Um, and the speed at which they flip backward um, and the kind of their, their arc um, is changed by their mass, kind of. So a lot of the tiny enemies will go like flying off into like a diagonal line and they'll kind of just poof into dust um, before they even have a chance to like really arc at all. Um, yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, so because these enemies are pretty big, um, they're huge and they're mechanical, I thought it would make sense for them to go all the way back to the ground. Um, and then explode. Um, but the explosion is not, you know, that was like, I, I'll just leave Andrew to that. Um, but this is, this is more, like, this is less what might actually be in the game and more of a proof of concept. And so for this sequence, when Bomberman, say, throws a bomb at the enemy, the bomb will explode, then the enemy is sent flipped backwards, and then once it collides back with the ground, it bursts into different pieces and probably also has more explosion mm -hmm. on top of that. Right. So, lots of violence. That's what Bomberman's all about! And then there's the programming of the enemy, which I, personally, have no idea how it works. So, Andrew, you're using Unreal Engine for blueprints. Look at this gorgeous spaghetti. What's happening here is when the training robot is... Oh, some of this code is, like, junk. When the training robot is spawned, it... <laughs> Sets. Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wait, hold on. Let me start someplace. Andrew, is this a good idea? <laughs> so I should preface this by saying this is probably extremely unoptimized and you shouldn't follow uh, what I'm doing here, but it works, so don't hurt me. The main thing that I should point out is how the robot behaves, like specifically in code. So you can see here, this is where he's trying to move to, which is... Oh, wait, actually, this is really complicated. <laughs> uh, I guess I'll also go through a... Uh, uh, oh, it's crashing. <laughs> one, so one second. So this is... um, This controls how the arms move. So you can see that it moves um, every random between 0 to 3 seconds. It'll change the arm locations between negative 45 and 45 for every axis of the arm. The uh, same principle kind of applies to the body. For every two seconds to seven seconds, it will change. Uh, well, if the if, if randomly 50% of the time it uh, is true, then it will change between 60 degrees and 180 degrees, and then it will uh, add that to its current uh, rotation and subtract it also. So, so it basically it this is basically just it picking you know where it's going to rotate to and then rotating that way, right? Yeah. Dang, I thought I could explain this better. You're killing me, man. You're killing me. I'm dying. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm gonna make an executive decision and say, probably, probably, <laughs> no. <laughs> let's uh, let's cool it with the programming. <laughs> and that's pretty much all we've got on this training robot. So, if you guys enjoyed this, make sure you do all of the things that you're expected to do on YouTube: smashing things, liking things, sharing things, especially you guys. You gotta share this with your friends. This is like the coolest thing ever. So go do that. <laughs> and uh, as always, we're very thankful to all of the people who support us on Patreon, which is something that we've just recently resumed. So if you have uh, any interest in supporting us and, and helping us to do more of this kind of content, you know, you can check out our Patreon for some rewards like special attention on the Discord server and things like that. <laughs> so go check that out. And uh, that's pretty much it. So thank you, Will and Andrew, for joining me on this very long recording. Who knows how, how long this video was, but... Uh, it was fun, though. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> All right, guys. Until next time, be sure to uh, stay curious. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> you 
said you weren't gonna use that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah what just... the heck? <laughs> In the moment, it felt right. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>